In early 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, it authorized the Secretary of War and his military commanders to forcefully, if necessary, evacuate all Japanese from the West Coast and relocate them where they could not aid the enemy in case of an invasion. Since the relocation centers were not quite ready, all 120,000 evacuees would be incarcerated at temporary assembly centers in Washington, Oregon, and California. Most of us in Southern California was, were sent to Santa Anita Racetrack, where we occupied the horse stalls that reeked of dress, dried horse manure and old hay. We stayed there for three months. If we were lucky, we occupied a stall that once housed famous horses like Seabiscuit or Citation. Several months later, we were all herded into train cars and shipped off to a far away, unheard of place. After four sleepless nights and day, going through barren, cactus-filled land, we finally arrived at a place called Heart Mountain, Wyoming. The name sounds beautiful and romantic. It was anything but that. It was near spectacular Yellowstone National Park. There were no similarities between it and Heart Mountain. Heart Mountain was a barren, forsaken desert land where nothing grew and no one lived for miles around. The first sight of the barbed wire enclosure with armed soldiers standing guard stunned us. This is what evacuation was all about. Hurriedly built military barracks arranged a military formation became our homes. There were hundreds of these barracks in a mile square enclosure overlooked by symbolic Heart Mountain. The barracks had no ceilings, just roofs and rafters, and the rooms were made into six partitions. There were public toilets, public showers, and public mess halls. The women's toilets did not have front doors, and the men's toilets were exposed. We were issued cots, two blankets each in a bucket and a, bu a broom. We were also given GI socks, GI underwear, GI coats, and pants. No one lived better than anyone's neighbor. Everyone had to make the best of it. Our family had two rooms where nine of us huddled together, my parents, my maternal grandparents, and five children. Within a few weeks, thousands of others were brought into until there were about 10,000 of us in that forbidden camp. During the first weeks, the food was mostly cereal, rice, bread, bread pudding, and sometimes meat. Our furniture were made of scraps of discarded boxes and lumber. During the cold winter months, we had pot belly stoves to keep us from freezing. My daily duty was to keep the bucket full of coal. And during the salt, hot, sultry summer months, we had to endure the heat and the dust storm that kept choking us. That first winter was excruciating. Those of us from Southern California had not been exposed to so snow, let alone the icy winds. Our clothes were thin. We stood in line for GI socks, underwear, coats, and pa wool pants. And some of the clothing had large patches over holes and torn pants. And those who could not work or buy their own clothes were given these battle-worn garments to wear. We always looked beyond the mountains in the, into the cold, threatening sky, hoping to be longing to be at the distant horizon where our homes, towns, and cities existed. We wrote letters and begged for newspapers and magazines to link us to the outside world that seemed to have abandoned us. Train loads of lumber and boards were brought into the camp, and we were told to cover the walls and erect ceilings for, in our rooms to keep out the wind and sand. The officials wanted to keep us busy to ward off restlessness and depression. During the five, first five months, a barrack served as a hospital with boxes and benches for seats. It was staffed with doctors among the evacuees. The only equipment was from their own medical kit. There was no plumbing in the hospital, and the water was hauled in fire buckets. Later, a hospital building was built, and the staff included two medical doctors, officers, and eight registered nurses. There were three categories of jobs. Group one consisted of latrine cleaners and coal gatherers, and they were paid $12 a month. Group two were the manual laborers who were paid $16 a month. 
And group three were the supervisors, professionals, and exceptionally skilled workers, and they were paid $19 a month. The ter internment camp became the third largest community in the state of Washington. The War Relocation Authority picked a supervisor to organize youth clubs. The primary purpose was to control the young, rebellious youths youth who had broken ties with parental guidance. The fam family structure was beginning to fall apart. Families no longer ate together. The older children mingled with their peers, and the younger children did the same. We were free to roam around the camp, and many of us joined clubs that interested us. To keep the internees busy, the camp authorities started art classes and dance classes, piano lessons, martial arts, and other activities. The adults, who for the first time in their lives had so much free time, were encouraged to learn knitting, flower arrangement, and they made flowers from paper, and ornaments they found, um, they made pins and ornaments that they found in the, uh, in the seashells. Occasionally, we had talent shows, dance recitals, and plays enacted by the internees. Some of the clubs were given YMCA and YWCA charters and were allowed to hold dances and socials. There were also Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops. And on Sunday mornings, hundreds of young people dressed in their best with neckties, polished shoes, parasols, high heels, hiked over the rutted roads and gullies through dust and mud to attend their respective church services. Christian, Catholic, Salvation Army, Seventh-day Adventist, and Buddhist. No schools, Alyssa asked. Yes, I said, we had schools in small crowded barracks with no ceilings, and we could hear very clearly the voices from the other classes. You had homerooms too? No, Alyssa, we all stayed in our classroom, so you knew everybody. Well, before we were put in camp, I told Alyssa, I had only a few Japanese friends. My other friends were whites, Mexicans, and a few blacks. And when I looked around the classroom in the barracks, I went on, I didn't not know where there were, so, there were so many Japanese in the country. And where did all the other Japanese go, she asked. Not knowing, I said, well, there were only 10,000 of us in Heart Mountain. Then the other 10,000, 110,000, must have been sent to other internment camps, like Jewish concentration camps like the Jewish concentration camps. My granddaughter is half Jewish and half Japanese, and she must have heard about the Holocaust from her Jewish grandmother. Who put you in these camps, Grandma? The United States government. Our country made prisoners of all of you? It was during the war his time of war hysteria, hysteria, I told her, and also a time for ambitious politicians to make a name for themselves by blaming the Pearl Harbor attack on all Japanese. You too? Me too. What were you able to take with you to that camp, Grandma? I told her that we were entitled to take one suitcase and the clothing on our back. Nothing else? Nothing else. And what happened to your homes? Your cars and household stuffs? Well, some of us had homes and we lost, and our cars and household stuffs were sold to people who came around looking for bargains. They offered $100 for the car, a few dollars for washing machines, and a dollar or two for the radios. And some of us stored our family belongings in temples or churches, and others had friends who had offered their homes for uh, storing their things. And one of our friends had just bought a brand new grand piano and when someone offered her $25 for the piano, she went into the garage, got an ax, and smashed, crashed the piano into bits and pieces before the, before the vulture. A brand new piano? A brand new grand piano. And who were the teachers in the camp? Alyssa wanted to know. Japanese? Some, I said, but most were Caucasian teachers who wanted to help us continue our education. 